I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Nobody, I don't think in this world, likes to settle for less. Or settle for something that is not quite up to what they want or what they need. At the same time, what we get from God, we are supposed to be content with. Paul says that contentment and godliness is great gain. We have before us a woman who gets crumbs from God, crumbs from Jesus. And she's quite happy to have them. But we can get more. And we should not settle for crumbs. Let's think on that as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Greetings to you this morning. Welcome to our service here at Trinity Lutheran Church. We follow the order of service as is printed out for you in your worship folders this morning. The first hymn is not, not 799. It is 779, right? And we sing all six verses.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us. And for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you, and of your will, and true obedience to your word. To the end, that by your grace, we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on him, he gives the power to become the children of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this Lord unto us all. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not let my enemies triumph over me. Save us, O God, from all our troubles. <laughs> Praise the Lord. O God, Father in heaven, your heart, O God, is grieved, we know. By every evil, every woe, upon your cross, forsaken Son, our death is laid, and peace is won. O Son of God, Redeemer of the world, your arms extend, O Christ, to save from the sting of death and grasp of grave. Your scars before the Father move his heart to mercy at such love. O God, Holy Spirit, O lavish giver, come to the aid, and your feeble child your grace has made how to make us grow, and help us pray. Bring comfort and joy, come to stay. <coughs> Please be seated. Let us give glory to our God.
O God, you see that we have no strength in ourselves. Protect us from the evil that surrounds us and from the temptations that arise within us. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. <clears throat> our Old Testament reading for this morning comes to us from the book of Genesis, chapter 32. Now Jacob arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jebok. And he took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he, God, wrestled with him. And he said, let us go down for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it you ask my name? And he blessed him there. And so Jacob named the place Penael. And he, for he said, I have seen God face to face. And yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel. And he was limping on his thigh. Therefore to this day the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he, God, touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm portion comes from Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. My help comes from the Lord. He will not allow your foot to slip. Behold, he who keeps Israel. Our epistle lesson comes to us from St. Paul in his first letter to the church of Thessalonica, chapter 4. Finally then, brother, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction on how to, you ought to walk and please God, just as actually you do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgresses and defrauds his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but sanctification. This too is the word of the Lord. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare His praise? Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you save them. Hallelujah. We rise for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from the region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. 
And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Here ends the gospel. We confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our study <clears throat> once again today is uh, again the gospel reading, the historic gospel reading for this second Sunday in the Lenten season. Matthew uh, chapter 15 verses 21 to 28. Looking especially at this verse. She said, Lord, even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. Your daughter was healed at once. O Lord, sanctify us with your truth. Your word alone is truth. Amen. 
Please be seated. I think we all know that we are all much better off. We are well off compared to much of the world. Either in prosperity itself, in our material possessions, or in the freedom and liberty that we have to use them, to acquire them, spend them. We're in pretty good shape. I don't think we would probably use the term settling to say, well, we, just, we have to live here in the United States. We, we're just settling. We'd probably be better off somewhere else. I, I, I doubt seriously that that's, that's in any of our minds. And if it was, probably wouldn't be here very long. To settle. What does that mean? Does it, as I uh, intimated at the beginning, to mean to be content with things, or is it mean to have less than you could have with maybe hardly any effort at all? That, in other words, you're, you're, you're selling yourself short. You're, you're, you're really not getting all that you really could have. I think it's the latter when we use that term to settle. So did the Canaanite woman, or sometimes referred to as the Syrophoenician woman, did she settle? No. She didn't. But are we, perhaps, settling? I think that may be closer to the truth here and the illustration that I want to bring out from this text. Let's look at it a little bit. Let's understand the context. Where is Jesus? What is he doing? Jesus had just crossed the Sea of Galilee, showing some miracles. He had just gone over to the area of the Gadarenes. He had just uh, cast demons out of uh, a man and... uh, cast them into pigs. Pigs jumped into the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he was teaching his apostles and others, and a bunch of Pharisees showed up. And they were always there. They were always at the back of the crowd, always watching, always taking notes, if you will. Always keeping an eye on Jesus, see what he would say, what he would do. And so they're there. And they're giving him a hard time about the Sabbath, and about things he said. They're just, they're just picking on him. And the people were kind of wavering. They, they were, uh, you know, they, they, they had heard some great things from Jesus. He had, he had fed the 5,000 and all that. Um, but, uh, you know, they, 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 many have left him after that because he had some hard sayings. And so he decided he needed a break. He needed to get away from the Pharisees for a while, go to another place where they would not follow him. And he needed to get away from these wishy-washy people who really couldn't decide, well, whether he's the Messiah or not. So he went through Galilee, and he went up into what is today Lebanon, into what was then called Phoenicia, to Tyre and Sidon, the region there. It was a pagan region. In other words, he knew the Pharisees aren't going to follow him because the Pharisees don't go to non-Jewish areas. The Pharisees stay away from Gentile areas. They don't want to go anywhere where they may be unclean. So Jesus knew, hey, I can get rid of these guys if I just go somewhere where they're not going to follow me. That's exactly what he did. So he goes into this pagan region, region of pagan idols, false gods, false religions, to get away for a while. A woman had heard about him up there, and this was common. 
There was a lot of trade going on between Lebanon and Israel in those days. Uh, there was a, a Roman trading route that went right through that area from uh, Israel uh, up north into what is Turkey today. And so Jesus had already been in a couple years of ministry, and so the miracles that he had done and the things that he had preached about and the parables and stories that he had told were, were already getting around to that area, and they were, they were into uh, that area of Phoenicia or Lebanon. And this woman, notice, is called a Canaanite woman, a pagan woman, or at least a pagan woman in, in her culture, as far as we know what this first word of her here, and found Jesus somehow, we don't know how, and said, Lord, I need your help. And more, she said more than that. She said, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. So she knew enough to know that Jesus had called himself the son of David, that other people had called him the son of David, and she understood what that son of David mean because she said, Lord, son of David. This means that this pagan woman, or a pagan culture woman, had put her faith in Jesus as the Messiah. She had seen him, she saw him now as the Savior, as the Redeemer sent by God coming down to the world to save the world. <coughs> now, now stop and think right now what that means. Here is a person who really shouldn't even exist. Why do I say that? Because, remember, when Joshua led the people of Israel into the promised land into Canaan. And remember, Canaan is much bigger than what we think of as Israel. Canaan goes all the way uh, from the Euphrates River up in what is today Syria, all the way down past into the Sinai, and from the Arabian Desert, where is Jordan today, all the way to the Mediterranean coast. That is the, the promised land. Okay? That was the land that God said to Abraham he would give to Abraham's descendants. And that includes modern-day Lebanon. And remember, when Joshua was, was to go into that country, God said to Joshua, kill them all. Wipe out all of the Canaanites, men, women, children, and even the animals. Kill them all. And of course, God, as God, as the author of life and death, he has the right to do that. We may look at that and kind of, you know, feel bad about it, but the fact of the matter is, God has a right to do that. And he said that the sin of the Canaanites is, I've had it up to here with them. I'm not going to put up with them any longer. And I charge you, my children of Israel, to go and exact uh, uh, discipline and, and uh, uh, discipline on them. Wipe, wipe them out. So she should, she, her ancestors should have been killed. Now, of course, we know Joshua and the other children of Israel did not do that. They left behind all kinds of Canaanites and caused them all kinds of problems, just exactly as God knew they would. But, but again, she should not exist. Well, here she is. I mean, did, 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 does it ever occur to you when you read this story, you've heard it probably a dozen times in your life, two dozen maybe. Does that occur to you? The, the, the Israelites did something wrong. They disobeyed God and they left the Canaanites alive. And yet God allowed that. God allowed them to do something wrong. And that something wrong turns out here to be a story in the Gospels to give us guidance and comfort. You see? I mean, folks, we can say, oh, God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform, but how often do we really consider the things that God does in order to achieve his will? I don't know that we consider it often enough. That's a crumb that we should not be satisfied with. We should get into that more in our lives. 
not in only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. Give some thought once in a while to what God may be doing in you. What God may be doing in your disease, what God may be doing in your ailment, physical or mental or emotional, <coughs> what God may be doing for you or those around you in your poverty or your wealth. Hmm? Once in a while, it wouldn't be a bad idea to expand on that crumb a little bit. To maybe get a whole loaf out of it. Huh? Yeah. So anyway, also notice, now she's a believer. We know she's a believer. We don't know when she became a believer, but by now, when she's talking to Jesus and calls him son of David, she's a believer. And notice something else. Notice that God allows her daughter to be possessed by a demon. So don't tell me that bad things don't happen to good people. You got it right here. A believer. Not only that, but somebody, I mean, imagine, you're a Canaanite, okay? You're used to worshiping Baal and Moloch and who knows what, Dagon. And now you're a, for lack of a better word, a Christian. What do you think the people around you are going to think? What do you think the people around you are going to do? They're going to make fun of you. If, if that's all, probably persecute you. Probably try to beat you up. May even put you in jail. So here's a person who turns from idol worship to believing in the one true God and Jesus the Messiah, and her daughter gets possessed by a demon. This is exactly what I tell people, folks. You know, when I take somebody, especially an adult, through adult instruction class, and I can't tell you how many times this has actually happened. I've actually seen this with my own eyes. I take somebody through adult instruction class, and sometimes their life is pretty good. You know, it's, it's not bad. It's not too shabby. And I take them through instruction class, and, and they become really committed, not only to Jesus, not only to the Bible, but to our Lutheran confessions and to our way of, of practicing and to our way of worship. And I tell them at the time of their confirmation, I tell them at the time I take them in as a member, look out, because now... If the devil wasn't after you before, boy howdy, is he going to be after you now? And folks, again, I can't tell you how many times it's happened. I, I, I mean, it, it's just happened recently, just, just within the last couple of years. The people who have been brought in to, to this congregation, and, and you know some of them, and their lives have been turned upside down. And they have had one problem after another. They've had physical problems. They've had emotional problems. They've had financial problems. They've had family problems. They've had problem after problem after problems after problems. And again, people might ask, why does God do that? Why does God allow Satan to come after brand new believers? Look at this one, brand new believer. Turned from idol worship to, to worshiping Jesus, and her daughter gets a demon possessed. Oh man, come on. Why? Same reason as anything else, for the glory of God. And again, I know that's easy to say, folks. I, I know it's easy to say, a little hard to practice. But it's true. So what did Jesus do? Jesus uh, didn't answer a word. Didn't even give her the common courtesy of an answer. Total silence. Just ignores her. The disciples, of course, they're, they're tired of listening to her after a while. Oh, Jesus, you know, do something. Send, send this lady away. Give her, basically what they were saying was, give her what she wants so she doesn't bother us anymore. Notice he doesn't talk to her. He talks to the disciples. And he says to them, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, boy, there again, there's something that you've got to stop a minute. Just stop a minute. Look at the crumbs here. Look at the crumbs. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. What does Jesus mean by that? What's he saying? He's simply saying, my mission is to deal with the Jews. My mission is to deal with the people of Israel. My mission is not to deal 
with the Canaanites or the Philistines or the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Egyptians. That's not my, that, that's not my task. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to deal with the house of Israel, fulfill the prophecies in the Old Testament, live a perfect life, and give that life on the cross for the sins of the whole world. Yes, then the whole world. And then you guys, you guys are going to go out and preach the gospel to the whole world. The, 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 the people in Siren Titan, they're not getting the gospel just yet. I'm only here to take a break. I'm only here to get away from those crazy Pharisees because I've had it with them, and I might, you know, blast them with a lightning bolt of <laughs> if I hang around there too long. That's all he was saying. He said, I'm not changing my mission. I'm not changing my mission. My mission stays the same. I know what my father wants me to do, and I'm going to do it. Notice what else he says. He's talking about the lost sheep of Israel. What are the lost sheep, folks, of Israel? Those are the unbelievers. Those who have wandered from the faith. In other words, Jesus is saying, i got a job to do, and the job is not for those who are already saved. The job is for those that aren't yet saved. He calls them sheep. Notice, he doesn't call them goats, does he? No, he calls them sheep. He is the good shepherd who is out looking for the wandering sheep. And again, so everything he's doing is for those who are not yet believers. He's got to go back to Israel. He's got to go back and do more miracles. He's got to teach more parables. He's got to give more sermons. And yes, he's got to die on the cross. He's got to go through his passion yet. For what? For the unbelievers too. Not just the believers, but for the unbelievers. But she probably overheard this. She's not stopping. She goes, Lord, help me, help me, help me, you know, help me. Now, finally, Jesus stops and talks to her. Finally, he turns around. But listen to what he says. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to, now here's a translation hidden for you. The Greek here really says, their dogs. Not the dogs, but their dogs. That tells us two things. First of all, the children he's talking about are not even Jews. Because no Jew would allow their child to have a dog as a pet. That's a fact. Dogs are unclean. Very, very unclean. The only dogs that were allowed in Israel, well, they, were allowed, they weren't really allowed, but the only dogs that were in Israel were scavengers. They were feral dogs, we call them. Nobody in Israel had a dog as a pet. Nobody. So whatever children had their dogs, their pet dogs, they too, they were Gentiles. And we don't know whether they're believers or unbelievers. He doesn't say. That's not the point of the parable. That's not the point of the saying. He says, so you've got, you got these Gentiles who have a pet in the house, have a dog in the house, which a Jew would never have in a million years. And they're eating, and crumbs fall from the table. The dogs don't sit at the table! The dogs get the leftovers. They don't get a plate. Well, at least not in this house. But, okay, maybe your house, I don't know. But, but they, don't get a, they don't get a place setting. They just get, to, they get the leftovers. And what Jesus is saying here, it's not right to take the main course off the table and hand it to the dogs. And her comeback is great. Her comeback is fantastic. Lord, even the dogs, again, pet dogs, feed on the crumbs which fall from their masters. She's calling Jews uh, uh, their, their masters sometimes here, uh, they fall off from their master's table. Wow. Wow. In other words, I'm not asking for the main course, Lord. I'm not asking for a super miracle of some kind. I'm not asking a big chunk of your divinity. I'm asking for a tiny little piece, just a tiny little piece. 
Realizing that, of course, that as God, the Messiah is God, of course, as God, it doesn't take, all it takes is a tiny word, just, just a, a single word from Jesus, and the demon, of course, would be gone. She knows that. So she says, I'm just, I'm just, just, you know, just say the word. Just, just talking about just a little crumb. That's all I'm asking. Just a little crumb. Now, at this point, we may say, gee, maybe she should have asked for more. Maybe she should have asked to tag along with him the rest of his ministry. Maybe she should have asked to be, uh, to be uh, uh, allowed to become an Israelite, full, full-born Israelite, and brought into the people of Israel. Maybe, who knows what she should have asked for, but she didn't. She was satisfied. She was content with crumbs, with just one little word, just that one thing, just, just cast the demon out of my daughter, that's all. That's all I'm asking. And Jesus says then, you have great faith. Let it be done to you as you wish. Let it be, you, you get your way. Okay? I'm going to do what you want to do. And, and she knows when she gets back home, she knows that the daughter, the demon left her at the moment that Jesus said these words. My dear Christian friends, again, I'm, I'm not criticizing the lady that maybe she should have asked for more. That, that's not my point here today. My point here today is that there are a lot of crumbs in our spiritual lives. There are a lot of little pieces of Jesus, a little pieces of the gospel, little pieces of God's grace that we get in the absolution, in our baptism, in remembering our baptism, in the Lord's Supper, in coming here to hear God's word and to worship Him. These are these are crumbs. These are little pieces that we get from God and that in some cases we return to God, we give back to God. From here, from, from Tyre and Sidon, Jesus went back and Jesus went back and gave the whole loaf. He went back and gave all. And the disciples got all. The disciples got the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The disciples got great miracles from God. The disciples got the Word of God. The disciples wrote the Word of God, and the disciples passed on that Word of God. The disciples went to all the edges of the world with the Gospel. The disciples built the Church of God. They were not satisfied with crumbs. Otherwise, they would have stayed in Jerusalem and died in Jerusalem. They took a whole loaf with them out into the world. And that's what exactly we need to do, my dear Christian friends. It's all fine and well and good to sit in these pews and be content on a Sunday morning, and that's fine. To be satisfied with the preaching of the gospel and the sacraments, that's wonderful. God bless that. But these are just little portions of God's grace and mercy. Just little portions of God's goodness. Let's leave here today with whole loaves. Let's leave here today with loaves and break off pieces of those loaves for others. And let's leave a trail in our lives of those pieces so that others can find their way back here. And dear Christian friends, I encourage you today Relish the crumbs that God gives you, but don't be satisfied with crumbs. Amen. And now the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in true faith. Through Christ Jesus, your Lord. Amen.
Please be seated for prayer. Dear God and Father, we give you praise for all your goodness and tender mercies. We thank you for the love which sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, through whom you have made known your grace. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and for your Holy Church, and the means of grace and the lives of godly people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure all that you have done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness by lives that are given to your service. Defend your holy church and give her ministers with a great measure of your spirit, and strengthen her through the word and sacraments. Unite your people in all the world in one holy Christian church, that they may bear witness to your love. Preserve our nation in honor, and continue your blessings to us as a people, that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives. Grant health and wisdom to all who hold office, and cause them to know and obey your holy will. Give all people a Christ-like mind. Remove all hatred and prejudice, and whatever hinders peace and justice. Sanctify our homes with your light and joy, and keep our children in the one true faith, and enable parents to raise them to a life of godliness. Bless farming and trade and industry, along with the arts and culture of our people. Give protection to those whose work is difficult and dangerous. Comfort with your mercy all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or adversity. Protect those who suffer persecution for the faith. Grant peace to those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow. All these things, whatever else you see that we need, grant us, O Father, for his sake, who died and rose again, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, and he gave thanks. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. I call it despising the sacrament if one allows a long time to elapse with nothing to hinder him, yet never feels a desire for it. If you wish such liberty, you may as well have the liberty to be no Christian and neither have to believe nor pray. But if you wish to be a Christian, you must from time to time obey this command of Christ. Congregation may now come forward for the Lord's Supper. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord, given for you on the cross for your redemption. This is the true blood of your Savior, shed for your sins. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Lord, Jesus Christ, given for you on the cross for your sins. This is the blood of your Savior, shed for your redemption. (laughs) 
Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of your sins. This is the true body of your Savior, sacrificed for you on the cross of Calvary for the redemption of all of your sins. This is the true blood of your Savior, shed for your redemption. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you on the cross for your sins. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up for you and your sins. This is the true blood of your Savior, shed for your redemption. Now may the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the one true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Depart in God's peace. Amen. Please join now in the Nunc Dimittis. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. O oh God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule in our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit so that we might be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.
Please join now in the closing hymn, the last two verses of the previous hymn. Please be seated. Once again, a very good morning to you all. Hope you're enjoying this beautiful weather that we're blessed by God with. Uh, today's fellowship over in the fellowship hall. Please do take advantage of that privilege. Uh, also, we have Bible class on Tuesday at 10 o'clock as usual this week and on Wednesday. Remember, please, the supper is at 5. Supper at 5. Service at 6. Okay, supper at five, service at six. Thank you, good morning. <laughs>